11 must-watch scariest horror movies released in 1982. Every decade has produced some great horror films which have kept us up all night. But without a doubt, the 80s were the best time for the horror genre. Most of the horror classics were produced in the 80s, and the year 1982 has a special place for the development of the horror genre. From slasher to science fiction, there was something for everyone. It didn't matter if you liked aliens or beasts or disjointed twins. There were a plethora of horror films to pick and choose from. I mean, John Carpenter's historical film about a group of scientists fighting with a thousand-year-old alien was released in 1982. I think you know what I'm talking about. But the year also saw several movies on paranormal concepts like The Incubus and The Poltergeist. In this video, we will take you on a roller coaster ride of the 11 scariest films that were released in the year 1982. But before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. And let's begin. One, The Thing. The movie begins in Antarctica, where we see a helicopter chasing a dog, dropping grenades and trying to kill the dog. They eventually land in an American research base in pursuit of the dog, and one of the Norwegian pilots ends up blowing himself up in the helicopter, while the other is shot dead in a case of self-defense. Now, an American pilot and doctor head to the Norwegian base, where they find several dead bodies and the remains of a humanoid, which they bring back with them. However, the dog now metamorphosizes and absorbs all the station's dogs, causing a disturbance. The biologist performs an autopsy and grows increasingly worried when he realizes that the dog creature could assimilate all life on Earth in a matter of a few years. This is when the problem begins. An alien-like creature is on the loose, and nobody can determine who is infected and who isn't, which leads to the ultimate problem. Who can they trust? US Outpost 31 finds itself gripped with extreme paranoia and claustrophobia. This 1982 science fiction horror film was directed by John Carpenter and written by Bill Lancaster. Based on the 1938 John W. Campbell Jr. novella Who Goes There? John Carpenter's The Thing is a masterpiece as far as claustrophobic and paranoid films are considered. And shockingly, the production began somewhere in the 1970s with several writers and directors, along with their different approaches to the story. John Carpenter, who finally directed this film, admitted that out of all the films that he had ever made, this was his personal favorite. The Thing is one of the best alien films out there and packs all the best elements like the horrific body horror of the Hellraiser franchise and gut-churning suspense from the Alien franchise. CGI in films only became popular in the 2000s, which is why this film is proof that an entire audience can be scared without CGI too. By the way, do not forget to check out our playlist on the Thing franchise. Two, Creep Show. This film is an anthology, which makes it a collection of short stories, and in this case, five of them. The title of these five short films are Father's Day, The Lonesome Death of Jordy Verrill, Something to Tide You Over, The Crate, and They're Creeping Up on You. The premise of this film is about a young boy called Billy Hopkins, who was greatly invested in reading a comic book titled Creepshow. However, his father disapproves of it, calling it horror crap as he takes it away from Billy. Now, as Billy sits near his window wishing hell on his father, he hears a sound. Turns out, it is Creep, the host of the comic book, who asks Billy to come closer, which then transitions into the first short film. Each film has something unique and sinister about it. The first one titled Father's Day is about an old man's corpse that comes back to seek revenge on his family, but especially his daughter who killed him, and he asks for the Father's Day cake that he never got. The second film, titled The Lonesome Death of Jordy Verrill, is about a meteor alien vegetation and not the brightest farmer. The third film is far more sinister. Something to Tide You Over is about a husband seeking revenge on his wife and her lover as he buries them neck deep on the beach. The fourth film, The Crate, is about an unusual beast that resides in the crate at Horlicks University. And the fifth and final film, They're Creeping Up on You, is a rather interesting one about a businessman and cockroaches. <laughs> Not the most common genre, but yet A-class, Creepshow is one of the best examples of horror comedy directed by George A. Romero and written by Stephen King, making it all the more significant because this was his screenwriting debut. A fun fact about these films is that in the second film, Stephen King himself plays the role of Geordie. This film is the perfect Halloween watch for someone who is in the mood to get spooked with a side of laughter. Three, The Entity. This supernatural horror film with several trigger warnings and an extremely tragic plot was directed by Sidney J. Fuhrer and written by Frank D. Falita. 
The plot revolves around Carla Mori, who is sexually assaulted in her own home by an invisible entity. After facing a near-death experience in a car accident, Carla's friend urges her to go see a psychiatrist. Dr. Schneiderman reviews bruises on Carla and learns about her extremely traumatic past and concludes that the paranormal experiences that she is going through are simply delusions and manifestations of her past. After Carla goes through more of these episodes, Dr. Schneiderman asks her to admit herself to a psychiatric hospital, to which she agrees. Soon enough, she runs into two parapsychologists and convinces them to come visit her home, eager to seek any kind of help, and they eventually agree to study her home and the paranormal activity. As events unfold, Carla's boyfriend ends their relationship after a disturbing attack, and the parapsychologists agree to experiment to get rid of the supernatural entity. However, will they succeed, or will Carla continue to be tormented by this entity for the rest of her life, losing her sanity as the days go by. In 1974 in Culver City, California, a woman named Doris Bither was allegedly raped by the ghosts of three men. The curious case inspired Frank DeFaletta to pen a book named The Entity in 1978, and this film is an adaptation of the same. Martin Scorsese included this film in his list of top 11 scariest movies of all time, and is based on the case of Doris Bither, who was sexually assaulted by an entity in the year 1974. Although this film might not be everyone's cup of tea, those who can stomach an extremely disturbing concept should add it to their must-watch list. Director Sidney J. Fury failed to create enough jump scares, but the fact that this is based on a true story manages to keep the audience riveted to their seats. Four, The Incubus. The film takes place in a small town in rural Wisconsin, where Mandy Pullman and her boyfriend Roy are swimming at the lake, when an unseen figure attacks and kills Roy, and then proceeds to sexually assault Mandy, because of which she is then taken to the hospital due to severe trauma. Meanwhile, Tim Galen, a teenager living in the same town, has recurring premonitions about a woman being attacked by an unnoticeable figure. As Mandy is being treated, Carolyn Davies, who is a local librarian, is brutally assaulted and murdered, and during her autopsy, Mandy's doctors discover similar wounds in both of them, while the doctor, sheriff, and reporter all have their theories on what might have happened, another woman is killed after Tim has had another vision about it. Jenny, who was Tim's girlfriend and the doctor's daughter, learns about these premonitory visions. She confides in her father about it, who, along with the reporter, learns a dark secret about the Galen family. Who was truly responsible for these murders and the violent assault of all these women? And will they be punished for their crimes, or only cause more trouble? This 1982 Canadian supernatural slasher film was directed by John Hugh, written by George Franklin, and based on the 1976 novel by Ray Russell. It is known for being an underrated slasher film of its time, but it deserves far more respect and love. I mean, the chilly, autumnal gothic setting and the camera work make it a treat for horror fans. The camera follows the film's victims just as a predator hunts its prey. While it may have some disturbing scenes that make you cringe, it does have an incredible plot and cast which keep you on the edge of your seat at all times. Five, the beast within. The beast begins with Caroline being sexually assaulted by the chained creature who breaks free and escapes. Now, 17 years later, Caroline's son, Michael, who was conceived because of the assault has become incredibly ill and the family returns to the town where Caroline was assaulted to find more information about the man who did that to her, just in case Michael's illness is genetic and linked to him. They learn about the unsolved murder of a man named Lionel Kerwin, which happened 17 years ago, but no one tells them anything about it. At this point, Michael is most likely possessed as he murders and eats Edward Kerwin, a newspaper editor. Michael collapses as soon as he reaches the house of Amanda Platt and the doctors advise him to get plenty of rest. As the events unfold, we uncover that the spirit possessing Michael is that of a man named Billy Connors, and he will stop at nothing to continue the cycle of impregnating another girl in the town. But will he succeed? Or will the townspeople be able to control this beast from causing havoc and torment? And more importantly, who is Billy Connors? This American horror film directed by Philip Mora is a very loose adaptation of Edward Levy's 1981 novel. The tagline for this film states that the motion picture contains scenes of graphic and violent horror. Beware, and it stays completely true to the same. An underrated cult classic, this film has been overlooked several times because of just how many horror films were released that year. Director Philip Mora's film may not have been as good as a few titles made by the likes of Cronenberg, Carpenter, Romero, or Raimi, but that doesn't mean it should be overlooked and underpraised. We suggest you watch it to know it. Six, Basket Case. 
The story revolves around Dwayne Bradley, who arrives in New York City with a locked basket and gets a room at a cheap hotel. He takes some hamburgers and feeds them to whatever creature is in his basket that talks to him telepathically. Dwayne takes his basket to see Dr. Harold Needleman, where he befriends his assistant, Sharon. Later that night, Dwayne goes back to Needleman's and empties the creature, who is revealed to be his twin brother Belial, onto the floor, then kills Needleman by gutting him with his claws rather effortlessly. Dwayne and Sharon now begin to form a romantic relationship, which angers his twin Belial and prompts him to cause havoc and kill someone. Later, we learn more about Dwayne and Belial, who were conjoined at birth but were surgically separated at a young age by some doctors, one of them being Dr. Needleman, thus explaining their reason for killing him. As events unfold, Belial and Dwayne kill the other doctors responsible for their separation. However, things go haywire when Belial grows jealous of Sharon and Dwayne spending time together. Will Dwayne realize it's time he's separated from his twin for good, or does Belial take Dwayne down with him? Written and directed by Frank Henenlotter, this cult horror film has two sequels which were released in 1990 and 1991 respectively. The crew of this film only consisted of three to four people, so most of the names you see in the credits are fake. Despite having a very low budget and little production, this film was scary enough to make a teenager wet their pants, while still keeping them hooked and entertained throughout. The Basket Case franchise might be forgettable, but the original will forever be remembered for the nasty special effects and the crudely disgusting and sinister villain in the form of Belial. Seven, Poltergeist. The story revolves around the family of Stephen and Diane Freeling, living in Sesta Verde, a California planned community along with their three children, Dana, Robbie, and Carol Ann. One night, Carol Ann begins conversing with the family's television, and a similar thing occurs the next day when we see a ghostly hand emerge from the screen. This event is followed by bizarre occurrences in the family house, which lead to a parapsychologist, Dr. Martha Lesh, and two team members investigating the house after Carol Ann is sucked into a portal. As they come to the conclusion of a poltergeist intrusion in the house, Stephen learns that the Sestiverta development was built on a cemetery and the graves were moved to a location close to their home. Dr. Lesh calls in the Tangina Barons, who is a spiritual medium, and determines that these spirits are attracted to Carol Ann's life force, along with detecting a presence called the Beast. The family decides to pack and leave the house, but Stephen briefly leaves the house before that, and mayhem ensues. Is it the beast who causes trouble, and will it let anyone from the family survive, especially Carol Ann? <laughs> this supernatural horror film was directed by Toby Hooper and written by Steven Spielberg, Might and Grace, and Mark Victor. Poltergeist was a critical and commercial success and became the eighth highest grossing film of the year and has been recognized as a horror classic. Many people have described this film as their favorite horror experience, with its truly terrifying plot, stunning visuals, and exceptional acting from the entire cast. The film is rather a drama on horror and psychology and excels on both fronts because of its practical and honest intent. Eight, Extro. The story begins with Sam Phillips and his son Tony playing outside, when Sam is suddenly abducted by a bright light. We fast forward to three years later when the light returns and plants a seed. A half-human, half-alien creature develops from the seed and is hit by a car, and it isn't long before the couple in the car dies. The strange creature then goes to a cottage nearby, where it attacks and impregnates a young woman before dissolving. When she awakens, her belly rapidly grows to a gigantic size until she gives birth to a fully formed Sam Phillips, who washes up and leaves in the car. His first instinct is to find Tony, who lives in an apartment building in London with his mother, her boyfriend, and an au pair. Sam picks Tony up from school and eventually goes to live with the family, claiming that he can't remember anything. He ends up drinking Tony's blood, and Tony soon discovers he has paranormal powers. Things go haywire when Sam and Rachel visit the farm they used to live on, leaving Tony behind with the au pair, who was eventually used as a womb for alien eggs. Sam takes an alien form, ready to take him and his son to the alien world, but will he succeed? Will Rachel be left behind alone after all is done? This British science fiction horror film was directed by Harry Bromley Davenport and has become an interesting part of British cinema and the horror genre. Although it didn't do very well critically, people have praised it for its twisted plot and surprisingly good special effects. At first, the film might be reminiscent of a pulpy B-movie, but then it has great ingredients like an unbreakable father-son bond, some frontal nudity, and most importantly, decently efficient special effects of the alien. Funnily enough, the film has one of the most bizarre sequences depicting coitus. If there's one reason you'll watch Extro, Make it this sequence. Nine, the Slumber Party Massacre. The film begins when 18-year-old Trish Davero's parents leave her home alone for the weekend, 
and she decides to host a slumber party for her basketball teammate, but they're in for a surprise. It turns out to be less of a party and more of a fight for their lives when Russ Thorne, the driller killer, escapes from prison. Unbeknownst to the others, one of the girls is killed after school before the party even begins, and chaos further ensues when they smoke marijuana and drink alcohol at the party. Russ gets to just about everyone, from the basketball coach to a telephone repair woman, from the next door neighbor, Mr. Content, to the pizza delivery boy, who unfortunately has both of his eyes drilled out. This film is funny in certain parts, since it originally was written as a parody of slasher films by feminist activist and author Rita Mae Brown, even though it ultimately was not filmed as a parody. You can even see Rita's latest novel at the time, Six of One, on the character Courtney's nightstand at one point. The movie is suspenseful, with a classic yet original killer and grisly murders. Directed by Amy Holton Jones and written by Rita Mae Brown, this is one of the many underloved slasher films that were released in the year 1982. It is the first installment in the Slumber Party Massacre trilogy, perhaps because of the feminist work of the screenwriter. It is not filled with gratuitous nudity, unlike other slasher films featuring young women as victims. Starring the late Robin Still in her film debut, the Slumber Party Massacre is a good choice if you're looking for something to watch while you sit back and relax. This is also the first credit for Scream Queen Brink Stevens. Grab some popcorn and find out if anyone can escape the Driller Killer in this very 80s flick. <laughs> 10. Forbidden World this film takes place in the distant future at a genetic research station located on the remote planet of Zarya, where a research team has created an experimental life form called Subject 20. This life form was built out of a synthetic DNA strand and was intended to avert a galaxy-wide food crisis. However, it mutates rapidly and kills all of the laboratory subject animals before cocooning itself within an examination booth. Soon enough, military officer Mike Colby and his robot assistant are called in to investigate the problem. After Colby settles in, his decision to terminate Subject 20 to prevent further deaths is met with resistance. Eventually, Subject 20 hatches from its cocoon, and it goes on a killing spree. Will Kobe be able to prevent Subject 20 from killing everyone, or will he also become a victim? This science fiction horror film was written by Tim Kernan and directed by Alan Holzman, who also co-edited it. People often compare this to Ridley Scott's film, which itself is a very high honor, but we will be very honest with you. While it is nowhere close to the classics that Mr. Ridley has made, Alan Holzman's films knows what it is and doesn't take itself too seriously. To watch the film, you need to expect very little from it, and you'll find yourself enjoying its story, acting, as well as its stark lighting. Forbidden World can be described as a trashy, fun experience, giving the audience a classic to remember. Eleven, Night Beast. A small alien ship is cruising around the solar system, but when it reaches close to Earth, it is struck by an asteroid and crashes in the small town of Perry Hall, and the sheriff of the town, Cinder, is soon alerted. However, the pilot from the spaceship emerges and kills some people who are around. Cinder confronts the beast with his men. However, the beast appears invisible when bullets are fired at it, and they lose many men to the disintegrator, whose rays kill them. The next morning, they get more help and manage to disarm the beast. The next step that follows is evacuating the town, but they are unable to convince Mayor Burt Wicker to cancel his party for the governor. Meanwhile, the Beast appears at the office of Dr. Price and kills a few men, but Price and the nurse manages to hide in the basement and devise a plan to try and trap the Beast. There is complete and utter chaos in the town, as they all must come together to try and get rid of this Beast in order to save their town. But do they succeed? Night Beast is a 1982 science fiction horror film which was directed by the cult director Don Dohler, and it can be considered a remake and sequel of sorts to his first film, The Alien Factor, which was released in 1979. While this film is notable for being another classic, it is also the film that featured J.J. Abrams' first screen credit ever. This film is action-packed from start to finish, with no dull moments, even though this film can be passed as a cheesy attempt at science fiction horror. With a beast that looks like a hairless gorilla, it still manages to keep everyone entertained for the entire duration. So that was our list for the best horror films from 1982. But the list will absolutely be incomplete if we don't give an honorable mentions to two films from the greatest horror franchises ever. These would be Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, and Friday the 13th Part 3. Both Halloween and Friday the 13th franchises transformed the way horror films were made and watched. Halloween 3 Season of the Witch This is the third installment in the Halloween film series. It is also the first film to be written and directed by Tommy Lee Wallace. The film revolves around Ellie Grimbridge and Dr. Daniel Chalice investigating the shady activities of Conal Cochran, the owner of the Silver Shamrock Novelties Company, after the death of her father under very suspicious circumstances. While the film didn't have the knife-loving Michael Myers, 
it is still a good piece of work. However, Season of the Witch comes nowhere close to the franchise's first film. Friday the 13th Part 3 This slasher film was directed by Steve Miner and is the third installment in the Friday the 13th franchise, set directly after the events of Friday the 13th Part 2. The story follows a teenage girl and her friends who go on a trip near Crystal Lake, where a wounded Jason Voorhees has taken refuge before he decides to go on yet another killing spree. This is officially the first film where we see the classic hockey mask, which has become an important trademark in the slasher subgenre and horror genre as well. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.